The 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly opens at the multilateral organization's headquarters in New York City. No single global crisis will dominate this session because the people of the world have seen no resolution to the war in Ukraine, a COVID-19 widespread economic instability and rising inequality, and the clear and present challenge of human-induced climate change. So what is on the agenda and what can we expect from this biggest of meetings of world leaders? And over the weekend, top officials from China and the United States held a quiet round of meetings in Malta. What are the key takeaways from the latest diplomatic efforts to cool tensions between the world's two largest economies? Salam, you're watching The Daily Debrief coming to you from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. Uh, before we get into the show, we take this opportunity to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. The great debate at the United Nations General Assembly in New York this year is set to be more fragmented and polarized than ever before. The ongoing war in Ukraine, the lingering political and economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly on the global south, the strengthening of regional blocs like the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and most recently the G77 plus China grouping. Floods, fires and rising global temperatures that have already had devastating impact on vast swaths of the planet. Nations reeling under debt and without the fiscal space to maneuver out of it. And of course, the economic power of China all form part of the patchwork background for this year's meeting. We are also at the midpoint towards the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals set in 2015 and largely ignored by the United States and its Western allies. All this has led to loud calls for restructuring both international financial architecture and reform multilateral bodies like the UN Security Council, backed, as we reported this week, uh, by the current Secretary General of the organization, Antonio Guterres himself. With all this as a little bit of context, let's go over to Abdul now to see if he can boil down what the most critical of these issues that might come up in New York this week are. Uh, Abdul, as I was saying in uh, the, the brief intro that I gave earlier, there, there's a lot going on <laughs> in the world today and I think we've asked you to join us this afternoon to uh, maybe try to simplify it for us uh, in a way that, you know, uh, we can digest uh, as an audience. Uh, what exactly are the most critical aspects that you think might be discussed uh, at the General Assembly this time around? Well, the UN General Assembly annual meet, of course, uh, discusses all the major problems in the world. Uh, that should be, that is, that has been the practice. And this time also is not going to be any different, of course. Uh, so, and uh, everyone knows that at this moment, the world is primarily uh, obsessed with two major issues, of course. One is the war in Ukraine and its larger implications across the globe particularly uh, on the third world countries, the countries of the global south, what we call it, or the developing world, particularly its economic aspects. So if you see the other uh, summits or the meetings which has happened before, the multilateral meetings like G77, before that G20 and BRICS and so on and so forth, all of them had this, uh, uh, had a discussion in and around this uh, war in Ukraine. And this time also it is going to be raised by particularly, uh, of course, different uh, set of countries from different perspectives. So that will be one. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the document which is going to be adopted uh, on Monday before the summit officially starts on Tuesday will also be uh, uh, focused around this issue. But this is not the only issue which the UN uh, uh, summit is going to discuss. There are, of course, major issues raised by the global uh, south in particular about the rising uh, concerns related to debt uh, of the large number of countries. Uh, dozens of countries in the, uh, the global south are uh, on the verge of uh, financially collapsing, primarily because of the kind of debt uh, they have been uh, uh, subjected to, uh, the kind of conditionalities they have been subjected to, and uh, uh, particularly by the international monetary organizations, financial organizations, dominated by the uh, the West. 
So that is one major concern from the global south uh, point of view. Of course, the climate issue is also going to be uh, discussed very, uh, uh, you can say, meticulously at this time. And this is also part of the document, as I said before, which will be adopted on uh, Monday. So UN General Secretary has raised the issue of uh, all these issues in a document which was released earlier, um, much before uh, the annual summit has started. And uh, it seems that there is, by and large, there is a, a kind of consensus about at least addressing the issue uh, in this uh, official, you can say, agenda document, which is going to be adopted uh, on Monday. Uh, this uh, meeting is also going, going to discuss the, uh, particularly from the third world perspective, the countries from the global south, and particularly the countries, uh, uh, you can say, in the West Asia and in some of the African countries, where there has been a growing feeling about UN being non-representative, UN being not bothered about the concerns of uh, 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 which are basically related to these countries, uh, particularly, for example, Iran, Syria, and other countries, which basically have been subjected to a renew, a consistent violation of UN Charter. So, for example, Israel has attacked uh, uh, Syria on many occasions. Syria has had filed complaints in the United Nations, and but on, on none of those occasions, the United Nations Security Council has taken any uh, notice of it. So Iranians have also complained about how Israelis and the US have been basically violating, attempting to violate the regional peace or the uh, 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 Iran's uh, uh, basically uh, security issues, national issues, and and there has been attempt to, uh, uh, you can say, uh, uh, demolish the uh, groups or the international organizations like IAEA. There is an attempt to influence it by the Western countries, and the UN has not taken the issue seriously. So these kind of issues from the African countries, as uh, everyone knows, that there has been recent set of coups in uh, uh, part of uh, Africa, and the role the Western countries have played, of course, violates uh, the uh, the basic UN Charter, and 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 most of the on these issues UN has failed to address the issues. So, to just to kind of sum it up, apart from the global issues, which are uh, it seems there is a consensus between the West and the uh, South uh, about the financial implications of Ukrainian war, the climate crisis. Um, uh, uh, the debt. Uh, apart from that, there are all, there, there there are also going to be issues raised uh, by the countries which think that UN has not been true to its uh, uh, mandate, and uh, there has been many compromises in the last. So these issues, of course, uh, are nothing new, but uh, 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 they are raised every year. But at least uh, whenever they are raised. There is, uh, there seems to be some kind of political uh, uh, backing behind it, and given the fact that at this moment uh, in the global politics, there seems to be a kind of clear-cut division where the West has stopped, kind of even uh, uh, voicing, uh, even paying the lip service which it usually plays, uh, pays about the concerns of the global South early in earlier occasions. It seems there is a complete polarization at the global level, and um, even among. The, um, uh, the permanent members of the Security Council. And that may play a major role uh, in this summit as well. Uh, last week or, or over the weekend, Abdul, we, we were uh, talking about the G77 plus China grouping, uh, which of course, uh, it is, it's called the G77, but it, it represents now over 80% of the world's population, 130 plus countries. Uh, will we see some kind of, uh, consensus from these countries, which again primarily represent uh, the global south, like you were mentioning, on issues like the sustainable development goals, uh, the targets that were set for 2030, we are now halfway there. Uh, how do you see that aspect? Because the SDGs are something that, uh, as an agenda point, have been highlighted by, by the UN Secretary General as well. Well, that is uh, going to be the central uh, issue of discussion, of course. The, as I said before, the document which is uh, going to be adopted on Monday, has basically uh, the is based around the, the reports prepared by the UN General Secretary and other UN institutions, which basically claim 
the the sustainable development goals which were adopted in 2015 uh, have basically whatever uh, the targets were the 17 major goals and around uh, 140 sub goals uh, targets which need to be uh, which needed to be uh, achieved before 2030 to address basically red, uh, address the issues of poverty hunger illiteracy inequality uh, climate uh, concerns and so on and so forth none of those issues ha are on target in fact only the report the un general secretary report claims that only 15% of the 140 targets uh, are on track and that too may uh, derail uh, get derail any time uh, if the the world does not refocus its attention on the as uh, 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 sustainable development goals so uh, the fact that the uh, uh, only 15% goals are on target me, uh, indicates that the majority of the countries have in the, in the world have failed to address to basically do what they committed when they adopted uh, uh, the SDGs in 2015. So uh, the report says, for example, that uh, the SDG says that the, there will be uh, no poverty by 2030, but the actual figures will be that more than 575 million people will be living under the poverty line by 2030 if the current pace of addressing poverty continues. It also says that it, around 80 to 84 per, a million children will be out of the schooling system. It means they will not get any uh, 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 education, which is uh, uh, which was uh, basically uh, there was a uh, goal that there will be complete literacy. Everyone will be in school by 2030. It says that if the current pace continues, the men women equality, which is one of the central uh, objectives of the SDGs will take another 280 years, more than almost 300 years to be achieved materially. Of course, we are not talking about the notional uh, uh, concept of equality. This is the material equality we are talking about. Even that is uh, almost 300 years away if this pace continues. So that shows that all these figure and facts basically show the SDGs have not been taken as seriously as required. And that is going to be the focus of the discussion uh, 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 from uh, Tuesday onwards when the world leaders are uh, sitting and, uh, and discussing uh, the global issues in the UN summit. If we can briefly take another minute or so to just, uh, just sum up, uh, presumably a lot of this uh, ignoring of or not taking seriously enough of the SDGs uh, is also influenced by the positions taken by the countries of the global north uh, and the West, in that sense, seems to be at least, maybe we are in an echo chamber, I don't know, but it seems like uh, the West is on a bit of a back foot uh, today, as it was even compared to maybe a year ago. Uh, how do you view the, the kind of debate uh, progressing and are there any, can there be any realistic expectations of structural reform like even the UN Secretary General himself very clearly is saying? Well, uh, that is uh, one difficult uh, question to answer given the fact that the West in particular has adopted, uh, basically prioritized uh, geo geopolitical issues or geostrategic issues over the basic humanitarian issues, uh, uh, which are the goal of the SDGs um, uh, in the last few years, it seems that the West is not very serious about it. So if you see the number of countries, particularly the poorer countries being sanctioned by the West in particular, uh, shows itself that these are the countries where the majority of the poor live. This is the, these are the countries where the hunger and other issues are there. And the, it is the West, this basically prevents these countries from achieving, even moving towards that while uh, imposing unilateral sanctions, not uh, approved by UN, but imposed by particular individual countries like US and European Union. These are the, uh, and the number of wars they have waged in last few years, uh, and the kind of destructive policies the, they have promoted. Apart from that, the, the, the reversals on the basic commitments to international regime like WTO uh, and the climate uh, commitments, they talk about Paris uh, commitments, but they fail to 
provide the basic uh, economic aid which is required to carry forward those uh, goals. So all these things, if you see, club them together, it seems that the West, as I, as I, as I said before, has prioritized geostrategic and geopolitical goals over the humanitarian uh, 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 needs of the world. And that basically is the basic reason, one of the basic reasons which defeats the entire objective of the SDG and, and derails it from uh, uh, from its real actual path. All right, thanks very much, uh, Abdul, for setting uh, the stage for what should be an interesting week uh, in New York City at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, and of course, we will hopefully have you back on the show to kind of sum up uh, if there are any real developments that emerge out of this meeting. In the latest attempt to ease a tense relationship, the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States, uh, Jake Sullivan, met with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who is an important figure both in the Chinese Communist Party as well as the Chinese government. The session took place in Malta and could perhaps set the tone for a meeting, a future meeting, between Presidents Xi Jinping and Joe Biden later on in the year. A White House readout on the meeting said several key issues were discussed, including, of course, peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, despite hopes to the contrary, China-US relations have nosedived under the Biden administration. And we go across now to Anish to put all of this into some kind of context for us. Uh, Anish, we were talking previously to uh, Abdul Rahman uh, about the UN General Assembly and what's likely to happen there as well as on the sidelines. Uh, in a sort of similar context, uh, the particularly the economic power that China wields today uh, is a is a crucial aspect in global politics. Uh, in Given the recent meeting between uh, the, the U.S. National Security Advisor uh, and the Chinese in Malta, how, how do you view sort of the scenario at present? Were there any positive developments uh, from the meeting that, that you would care to talk about uh, in terms of what the two biggest economies in the world are doing and, and whether this sort of uh, escalation from the United States of all kinds of pressure on China is likely to continue or will we see a potential cooling of relations? Well, uh, the, Wang, uh, the meeting with Wang Yi uh, by the National Security Advisor is not really, uh, you know, it's not lacking substance. Obviously, there was a lot to be talked about. But the outcomes uh, are quite easy because we are not very sure uh, what it can actually lead to. Uh, there are no commitments made, obviously, but uh, there were very clear statements being made, especially from the Chinese side, uh, who told the U.S. basically that th there is a red line when it comes to Taiwan and the U.S. cannot cross it. And that was pretty much at the heart of uh, the discussions there. Uh, and the fact that the foreign minister is meeting the national security advisor and not his counterpart also pre uh, shows that this was more of a defense security kind of meeting. And so definitely recent kind of overtures that we've seen on uh, the military front, especially across the Taiwan Strait, uh, and also, you know, in the general vicinity of Taiwan, uh, not just from Ch the Chinese side, but definitely from the US and Taiwanese side, uh, especially Taiwan, which has started dragging in a lot of other foreign players, including Japan uh, and the uh, Philippines and, you know, also they are people that who do not have any kind of claims to the island, who have, uh, who has a different kind of history, it's not mm -hmm. the kind of history that uh, requires, you know, is positive in many ways, uh, and definitely uh, provoking the Chinese side to conduct joint uh, military drills, uh, increasing uh, naval operations in the region, and even you know the uh, maneuvers by Air Force uh, military on both sides have actually created a situation that is quite tense. And we have talked about this, uh, you know, be Taiwan being turned into a sort of a flashpoint uh, between uh, between two great powers. And that is definitely what the Chinese also wants to avoid. And we, uh, we are seeing that the Chinese wants to make very clear that there is a proper one China policy. That is not something that just China advocates but also what the government in Taiwan, the constitution in, in Taiwan, which calls itself the Republic of China, also advocates, and which the United States has endorsed in the 1970s. 
and that the, pretty much the entire world abides by. And there is literally no question about sovereignty here. But definitely, the US has been pandering to a lot of secession movement, and that is not something that Chinese will stand by and watch. Mm. Uh, we were also talking about the sort of growing pressures uh, on the West in in many ways. Countries of the global South uh, kind of coming together, uh, whether it's regional organizations or groupings like the G77 plus. Uh, in 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 the China U.S. context, and it's it's not a good thing for the rest of us uh, that these two great powers, as you mentioned, are are, are not getting along. Uh, do you see? Given the General Assembly is also meeting and so many multilateral meetings are taking place, uh, do you see the opinions of other nations, whether it's from uh, from Asia or, or uh, allies of uh, the United States, coming into play in these conversations uh, and, and sort of uh, working towards what is uh, for maybe a larger uh, good? Well, it's very difficult to say because uh, even as we speak, the United Nations General Assembly is pretty much becoming a battleground of sorts. Uh, we are seeing Zelensky being platformed by the West a lot. Uh, we are seeing uh, the Ukraine uh, issue being, uh, you know, raked up uh, quite heavily. And there is definitely certain level of other, uh, you know, obviously certain other issues that the United States is trying to raise which are not good, especially the recent Kim Putin summit and that is definitely not going down well with not just Russia or North Korea but also China because a large part of that is also targeted at the Chinese influence in the region or its uh, allies in the region and that is definitely going to have its own impact and that's pretty much why we see uh, the Chinese vice president and not the president or the foreign minister being part of the assembly and that clearly shows that the Chinese, and with even with the meeting with Blinken that is happening right now, uh, the, on the sidelines of the General Assembly, uh, we're clearly seeing a certain level of wariness. Obviously, China wants to talk, wants to keep diplomatic uh, channels and options available at all times, uh, at every given chance. But it really does not, uh, uh, you know, trust the Americans to go through with a lot of their promises. We have seen in the past that that has been, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, promises being made or even commitments being made by the U.S. Uh, has been met with other sorts of provocations, which uh, kind of contravene the, the spirit of those commitments in the recent, right. uh, you know, in the previous set of summits. So that is not something the Chinese uh, is not aware of. It pretty much is aware of it and is quite wary of whatever the U.S. has to offer at this kind of point. All right, Anish, we'll leave it there for now. Thanks very much for that update. And with that, we bring to a close this episode of uh, The Daily Debrief and begin our week's coverage of the news beyond the headlines. As always, we take this opportunity to invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Don't also forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. Uh, we'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, thanks as always for watching. Stay safe. Goodbye.